Let's say, for example, you went two weeks with less than five hours of sleep each night. What would actually happen? Now, some of you watching do get five hours of sleep or maybe six hours of sleep, but you don't get seven or eight hours of sleep. So some of these symptoms I'm going to talk about uh, can affect you, but more on a, a moderate or mild basis. But what you need to know is there's a huge, huge consequence of not getting enough rest. I remember as a kid, I slept so good. I would get nine hours of sleep. And then I got a little bit older and went through basic training, and I was really awakened at four o'clock in the morning. Well, ever since then, I tend to get up at four o'clock, and that's why I go to bed a little bit earlier to try to get that seven hours. So I've had a really long history of poor sleep to the extreme, where some nights I didn't even sleep one minute. I laid there the entire night. Torture. So ideally, getting seven to eight hours of sleep is super healthy. I looked at some research on this uh, 35 years ago. The average U.S. adult slept 7.7 hours, which nowadays it's significantly less. I mean, even if we compare 20 years ago uh, to now, there's way more people getting less than six hours of sleep than just 20 years ago. As a nation or even the world, we're just getting less and less sleep. So let's go through all the consequences of not getting enough sleep, especially if you're not getting at least five hours of sleep, okay? First of all, why do we need rest in the first place, right? Well, that's when a lot of things recover. That's when our muscles recover. That's when we burn the most fat. That is when our bodies do the most detoxification. That's when our brains detox. And so this is why when you don't get enough sleep, you're gonna feel kind of toxic, especially in your head. So the first problem you're gonna run into if you're not getting enough sleep is fatigue or what they call daytime uh, sleepiness. And there's nothing worse than driving when you're tired, right? Especially long road trips and you're just like dozing off at the, at the road. It could be very, very dangerous. There are significant mood changes when you don't get enough sleep. Way more than other types of cognitive problems like memory, attention, and loss of focus. Your mood will probably be one of the biggest things that will change. You're no longer gonna be happy and, and upbeat. You're gonna be a bit depressed, agitated, and irritated. Now thinking about that, can you imagine how many people are put on psych drugs when really they just need a good night's rest? The next thing I wanna mention is the cognitive function, mainly memory, focus, and concentration. So if you are a student, right, trying to study, or you're someone that has to focus on some type of creativity, let's say you're a writer or you have to come up with content or you're a content creator like myself, Boy, being tired just shuts that right down. And so this is why I like the brain booster industry, all these different pills that people take, you know, caffeine to try to stimulate their, their mental capacities to help them focus, not to mention drugs as well. Unfortunately, that's treating the symptom and not the cause. And that's why the person always gets worse. Very interesting study, which I'll put down below, involving 3,000 students who all got poor sleep. Well, actually less than six hours. There were mood changes, there were behavior changes, there was an increased desire for alcohol, there were self-esteem issues, there were decreased ability to learn. Even on top of that, there was an increased elevation of a suicide risk. The other thing that happens when you don't get enough sleep is you have something called sympathetic hyperactivity. There's a part of the nervous system called the sympathetic nervous system, and that system is in overdrive when you're not sleeping. So you're gonna have more adrenaline. You're gonna have more cortisol because your adrenals are revved up. And so yes, it is true that having an overactive sympathetic nervous system or a stressed out or overactive adrenal can keep you up, but also not getting enough sleep can then cause the adrenals and the stress and the sympathetics to kick in. The sympathetic nervous system is kind of like the accelerator of the nervous system. And you're not going to be able to sleep if it's accelerated. And so it's the other system that kind of puts the brakes on this flight or fight mechanism. That's called the parasympathetic. Both of these systems can be measured. And um, I may or may not have uh, information on this when you're looking down below, searching for it in the description, but I will very soon. There's a great tool that you can actually visualize this part of the nervous system and see where you're at. You can look at your stress and you can also look at your ability to recover and many other aspects related to that, like should you really be working out today or not? Maybe you should be walking. 
Because if you're not sleeping and you're sympathetic overdrive or hyperactive, you should not be uh, exercising of any type of high intensity at all. You should be walking because it's going to put more strain on your heart. So this sympathetic overdrive, especially if it's chronic, okay, it goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks beyond just two weeks, but might go on for months or years, really put stress on your heart. You're going to be at risk for cardiovascular problems, at risk for a stroke, at risk for being a diabetic. Why? Because cortisol and adrenaline releases sugar, which then increases insulin. Despite not eating any sugar, your sugar levels will be higher because even the name of the adrenal hormones, another name for cortisol is glucocorticoids because it regulates glucose. So this is why you have impairments with your glucose and uh, problems with your blood sugars and insulin, which then relate to weight gain in the fatty liver. The other very unique thing that happens with that cortisol being elevated is your immune system shuts down. It becomes paralyzed. When you have higher levels of cortisol, you have this lessening of the white blood cells. They don't work. And this is why all of these... Um, conditions that involve autoimmune problems, right? Where you have these antibodies attacking your own tissues, or even people with um, certain skin problems, allergies, or inflammatory conditions because it's an overactive immune system. The general treatment is steroids. What's a steroid? Cortisone. Because cortisone is an anti-inflammatory, but it's also an immune suppressant if you can't sleep, right? You're getting less than five hours and you have this sympathetic overdrive and you're trying to lose weight, good luck. It's not gonna happen. In fact, you can work with someone on their diet, but boy, if the sleep is not right and they're also exercising at the same time, you're just wasting your time. Getting someone into a wonderful rejuvenating sleep, that can create huge changes in weight loss. The next thing, getting less than five hours of sleep will impair your recovery. I'm talking about recovery from an injury, recovery from stress, and recovery from exercise. So most of the recovery, if not all the recovery from exercise occurs when you are sleeping, if you are sleeping. And so if you're exercising and not sleeping, you're not going to see the benefit of the exercise. You break down the body and you keep breaking it down, but you never recover. Then you exercise over that. You'll have a lot of issues. So the rule of thumb is don't ever do high intensity exercise when you haven't slept and when you have poor recovery. You're not going to adapt and benefit from that exercise, but you can do walking. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is sleep apnea, because this also falls in this same area where the person is just not getting enough oxygen when they're sleeping. And that's why they have to use a CPAP machine to uh, blow oxygen or sometimes just air into their upper respiratory and in their lungs. And this also includes a lot of people who uh, have heavy snoring and that creates something called hypoxia. Okay. That's just a lack of oxygen. And anytime you have a lack of oxygen, you also might have an extra increase of CO2. So not enough oxygen is bad. Too much CO2 is bad. It can be toxic. So you need the balance of both. You don't want all oxygen either. You want some CO2 to allow that oxygen to penetrate deep into the cells, but you need the right balance. But when you have like sleep apnea and you're obstructing air going into your body, especially when you're sleeping, it can create even more severe uh, problems with your body. Like brain atrophy, the frontal cortex actually atrophies and shrinks in people with bad sleep apnea because you're depriving the brain of oxygen when you're sleeping. You also can develop an increased risk of cancer and cardiovascular incidents, and as well as strokes and diabetes. So there are many things you can do for sleep apnea. I have those in a lot of different videos, which I will put down below. Just for people who don't get enough sleep, the most effective treatment for that right off the bat is taking a nap, okay? Just taking a nap, or just trying to lay there until you hopefully fall asleep to get some more sleep. A couple more tips on this topic. You want to keep your uh, room on the cool side between 60 and 65 degrees, maybe up to 68 degrees, but keep it cool. If you can keep your window open, you'll sleep a little bit better, but having a room that's real stuffy and hot is not a good thing. If you're 
humidity in the room is like 50%, you will find that that would be the optimum humidity for the best sleep. Another really important thing is to turn off all the electronics in your room, especially next to your head when you're sleeping. Why? Because this EMF wave stands for electromagnetic fields, okay? And magnetic fields um, really affect the brain waves in the heart, and that can affect your quality of sleep big time. It did for me. In fact, I found the wires in the wall and back of my bed were crossed, and that was creating an electromagnetic field that extended eight feet from the wall. So I was being bathed in this magnet energy that just was not good for my heart. I started getting heart palpitations. And I eventually figured out what it was. And when I had the electrician fix it, all of those symptoms just magically disappeared. Another really important thing is um, the quantity of food that you eat, especially in the evening, okay? If you do too much, you're not gonna sleep that well because when you're bloated, that affects your sleeping up here. So you don't wanna overeat and then you also don't wanna undereat. Some people that don't consume enough protein or the right amount, um, they can also have a hard time getting to sleep, staying asleep, or waking up and feeling refreshed. So I think the key is to play around with the amount of protein that you need. And I would guess that would be anywhere between like three and a half to seven ounces of protein for that dinner, depending on a lot of different variables, you know, your size, your, your age, your activity level, your ability to digest that protein. And it's best not to eat uh, too late. It's best to eat earlier, okay? You're gonna find you're gonna sleep better if you can not have a lot of uh, stuff going on with the digestive system. And the other thing is as it starts to get darker and let's say six, seven o'clock, start dimming the lights wherever you are at. Try not to sit in front of a computer screen because that blue light, especially the artificial lights, can interfere with the whole mechanism of um, the light going into the retina, which then goes to a whole cascade of things that increases your melatonin. Darkness triggers melatonin. Light decreases melatonin. Melatonin helps you sleep. So it's best that you tone down the light in the evening. Now, because of the censoring and the suppressing of the algorithms on YouTube, it's becoming more difficult to find my content and there's a lot of content that I cannot put on YouTube, unfortunately. So to make sure you have full access of all my information, go to drberg.com and subscribe to my newsletter by clicking the link down below in the description. I will see you on the other side.